I'm Colin Dangard, and you're back on the Colin Dangard Show. Well, how do we get how do we get employed? How do we make a living? These are very important questions that everybody has to answer constantly, it seems to me. Which brings me to the basis of our activities in life and what we do with our time and our energies. It, uh, so what I'm really talking about is how to start a business. Now you can work for somebody and get a wage and uh, you're assured, fairly assured today, that that wage will continue. So that has its, um, its own security. However, deep within that security is the reality that you might one day piss off the boss and within an hour you'd no longer have a job. That's something to address. And that's one of the problems with, uh, with being employed. You might really like the job, but it could develop into a way over a period of time where it doesn't like you or other people in the job don't like you. There are variables. Now, I've always been difficult to employ because basically I have a lot of opinions. So very early I decided to be my own entrepreneur, my own employer. And that worked for me greatly uh, from the very beginning when I first started uh, out in the bush. I, um, in those days I had a lot of trouble speaking and, and uh, I earned money by rounding up uh, and chasing brumbies in the bush, brumbies being wild horses, America would call them mustangs or whatever. Uh, they weren't really wild, they were abandoned stock horses. So I had... Uh, steal toilet paper from uh, government railway sidings and outhouses and make a big V and run the horses at the V and exhaust them over the next three days and by not feeding them and not watering them and letting their heads drop and then I'd take them to tobacco farmers, newly established in Australia, and sell them. So I very early learned that earning money by selling something is a real way to riches. And when you think about it, everybody in the world makes money by selling something other people want. In my early discovery, it was that the impoverished tobacco farmers needed something to, a machine to haul their tobacco from the fields. Uh, so it was very easy to now sell them horses as they were too poor to have tractors. Uh, until they got their farms going and they made some money. So it was, uh, I sold them horses. And I'd sell a horse for as much as it would take a man uh, two weeks of work. I'd sell one horse. It was absolutely money in the bank. And then now I'm out in the bush and I got no real expenses because I'm spearing fish and spearing wallabies and eaten very well and now I'm getting I'm making money on top of that. So I very early was immediately an entrepreneur. I thought, well this is great. And that's how I stayed for a long time. I became a um, uh, a writer because what do you do out in the bush when you're by yourself? Well you can you can whistle or sing tunes or something, but I sat down and with a typewriter an old boy had given me and I wrote stories and became quite literate and quite good at writing stories, mostly by copying Jack London and and uh, anybody else who was very who was on top of the J D Schlesinger or um, or any other very popular writer at the time, and it was very easy to do really just copy somebody else and out of that copying became your own style you thought oh you got, I got a better way to put that and so I developed my own style well I quickly became very um, very successful at selling stories so I was an entrepreneur I was selling stories easy to do in those days no television everybody amused themselves with uh, with just um, uh, books and and uh, magazines to which I I uh, handed my 
stuff to all the time. Women's magazines for romance, guys' magazines for blood and gut stories. And um, it was very easy to make money. And on the side, I'm selling uh, horses to impoverished tobacco farmers. More cash there. And um, then I became... My Aunt Mary said to me one day, she said, uh, call me into her place in, down at Cairns City there. And she said, I'm reading your stories in these magazines and you write very well. You should uh, get a job and do something. So I got a job. But I remained an entrepreneur even in that job. I extended my... I worked for the newspaper, the Cairns Post, and I was a staff reporter, but I worked night and day and all weekends writing other stories for other publications uh, that were not competing with the Cairns Post and um, sent them all around the world and uh, gradually extended my reach into all kind of magazines and all kind of fields that um, I'd write one story and copy it 50 times and send it to 30 countries. And uh, by the time I'm 17 or 18, I'm, I'm making very, very good money, not just uh, by being employed as a reporter for the Cairns Post, but um, as a correspondent. Then I travelled all around the world, uh, finding new, new uh, date lines for stories, India, the Far East, the Mideast, uh, Russia, every place. And it was very easy. Just find an American who was wandering around the place and didn't, as a tourist and say, oh, where are you from? He'd say, well, I'm from Detroit. Great, what are you doing here? Oh, well, I've done this and I've done that. And he'd recite his adventures and right there I'd, I'd have a good story that I'd then look up Detroit and I'd find that there was a newspaper, a big newspaper there called the Detroit Free Press. And so I sent it to them and they'd publish it. And then I'd get the same story and send it to magazines in other countries and became uh, quite an entrepreneur until I decided that I really had to go to America because America is uh, it's the front of the ship. There's all the other countries. They're all behind the front of the ship. They're in some other part of the ship. Not to be denigrating to them, but... America has, has attracted capitalists and entrepreneurs from all over the world. That's why people come here. They flock here. Go to any American embassy in any country in the world and there's a line around the block just to get an interview, to talk to somebody and tell them you want to go to America. Well, that's how it is and that's how it ought to be. But um, So I came to America and then I had to get, actually get a job because uh, the immigration department wanted nothing to do with me if I was not employed, understandably so. So I got a job in the Miami Herald as a staff reporter. Meanwhile, I'd, I'd developed this very extensive global network of other publications who wanted my stories. So I would um, write my stories for the Miami Herald because I was on staff with them, and on the weekend I'd... I'd uh, work all weekend and sell stories and send them all around the world again. So um, I was I was uh, continuing my entrepreneur cycle and this would end up in me at one point being the highest paid uh, print journalist in America on a freelance basis. Uh, I was just found it very easy to make money. But the point of all this is I was successful because I found something I love doing, and that is writing in the English language. In starting a business, that's the most critical thing you have to do very early in your life. Find something you're passionate about and do something with that. I don't care what it is. It could be painting, it could be training horses, it could be... Um, doing stuff with glass or doing something with wood or or whatever. Uh, but you'll find there's something that you like more doing more than you like anything else, doing anything else. So you, you do that, and that's a really sneaky way to actually never work again because you're doing something you like. What if you like fishing? Well, why don't you get a boat, go out in the seas there and start catching fish and selling them to fish markets and and 
soon you could have a fleet of boats doing just that. But you started out doing something you really love, and that was fishing. Now, it could be messing with wood. Well, they build houses out of wood. Uh, at least they used, most of, they used to build most of the houses out of wood. Things have changed. But if you like building things, well, build, start building houses. That's a really great thing to do. Um, or if you like taking care of people, there's a whole medical industry that would love to have you uh, as part of their ranks. Um, or if you want to be a painter, you can paint houses if that's what you want to do, or you can paint portraits if that's what you want to do, or you could do creative painting if that's what you want to do, but there's a whole market there. And uh, technology has opened up a whole new field of opportunities if you like messing with uh, computers when you're a kid, well, guess what? Just keep with it today and you'll be a highly paid uh, technician working on computers. Um, or, as I said, if you like caring for people and you like plumbing, you could become a, a, a surgeon. Plumbers are simply surgeons of the human body. Um, they direct flow, blood flows uh, through channels just like... Uh, Plumbers direct water flow through channels. Same deal, except we have a heart and a soul. Um, which brings me to the point, our heart and our soul. Whatever you do, you, you, you need to have your heart in it and your soul in it. And it should embody you completely, head to toe. That's what you are. I became a writer because I'm fascinated with the English language and how complicated it is but yet how beautiful it is. Um, there are probably 10,000 words uh, in the English language that are halfway recognisable to most people. Well, guess what? I made a very good living as a writer and still do. And uh, I would say I'm familiar with about 500 words in the English language. That would be a stretch. So... It shows you what you can do with actually very little. I'm not an English professor. I don't. I don't claim to be. I'm not a. I'm not a master uh, of anything other than s telling stories. But I'm a master at that because I come from a. As I've said before, I come from a long history of uh, people telling stories. Half of me is Irish, which is a lot of stories right there. And the other half of me is uh, uh, Danish, uh, so I'm half Viking and half storyteller. Well, there's a lot of uh, story opportunity there, isn't there? It's uh, bred into my DNA. And um, that's something else. We are born to be something, and we all have to be something. Otherwise, we're nothing. If, we're, if we don't do something we love, and we don't do it with passion, and we don't do it with a a great sense of sharing it with others, then we are actually destitute. There's two ways to be destitute. You can have no money, that's one way. But it's uh, it's a temporary way, really, especially in America where money is the most available commodity there is. Everybody has some sort of money and there are a few people who have stacks of money and lots of people in between who have more than enough that they can spend. But the successful people you'll find, if you scratch the surface, they're all doing something they love. Great musicians love music, so they're, they're caught up in it, and that's their world. Um, great writers are caught up in the language, and that's their world, whatever that language is. Uh, there are great Spanish writers, there are great Latin writers, there are great English writers, there are great Norwegian writers, there all of them are applying the language of their birth mostly because that's the one we're closest to. Uh, but there's, there's opportunity in absolutely everything. So my, my, my advice is, number one, to start a business, select one you love. And from that day forth... You'll never work again because you'll be doing something you love. Number two, make sure if you want to be financially successful, 
make sure this passion is some, something that somebody else also wants wants to be successful you've got to produce a product that has a need if you produce something that has no need that's an uphill battle you might think you're a great landscape painter so you paint beautiful landscapes and that might be wonderful for you but then you have to find people who would hang landscapes on their walls well that's narrowing the field isn't it that's getting your market now has diminished quite considerably you have to find just the people who like just landscapes and you've got to find somebody who likes your style of landscape that gets even worse or more narrow you could become a gardener that's a good thing people love flowers and they love to to uh, to grow vegetables and do all that and you could indulge uh, your passion for gardening i'm a gardener and i love gardening uh, and you could sell that expertise the trouble is with that you'll go to somebody's house and and i have a friend who's doing this and she complains all the time that she goes to somebody's house, spends a day telling them, yeah, well, grow this here, put that there, take that old shed down, put another shed over there, do this to that. They'll be take, The person will be taking notes and pretty soon um, she'll call the person up again and a month later and say, well, what are we doing? She said, well, I, your ideas were great. I've, I've uh, about done it. You should come and see what I've done. Well, the person made no money out of giving that expertise. However, I advised her, I said, well, you're giving something away that you shouldn't be giving away. You should be charging for it. Uh, if you're going to be a consultant, you've got to charge a consultancy fee. It makes sure you get your money up front. If you're going to give somebody an idea uh, of how to solve their problems, that's worth something to them. It should be worth something to you too. So um, there's endless opportunity uh, you like building well if you like sailing build sailing ships that's a good thing if you like building houses well like I said you can build houses uh, human beings have been building things since the uh, beginning of time when the first house structure was a uh, some some bark ripped off a tree and leaned against a another tree and that was their first uh, abode and it grew from there we learned to use clay and make bricks out of clay and that became materials for the better abodes and so it went on and on and on and it's still going on today the technology people are fearful of a1 and ai and and say well it's going to be the end of the world but it's not going to be the end of the world it's going to be the beginning of a whole new world uh, just as when computers first came out everybody thought wow now we've got computers, we won't have to think anymore. Well, guess what? That computer is only, is only as good as you think. It is a tool. And computers greatly elevated our standard of living, our standard of working, our standard of everything. And AI is going to do the same thing. It's going to greatly elevate everything that we touch and everything that we do. But guess what? It'll never be us. It doesn't have a heart and it doesn't have a soul. It only has within it what you put in it. And if you don't put it in, it can't deliver it back out. It's as simple as that. You can give it ingredients that it can munch around and come up with another uh, rendition of what you had put into it, but it still depends greatly on what you put into it. So AI is, again... Uh, not our enemy, it's going to be one of our greatest, greatest advances ever in our lifetime. And after the AI, there'll be something else. Don't know what it is, but there'll be something else. Maybe it's Martians coming down here and showing us what they got. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's, a, a, there's thousands of other Earth planets out there with uh, inhabitants on them, uh, somewhat like us, I don't know, but it's um, a far stretch to think that we are the only living creatures in all of the multiple universes. We may be the only living creature on this universe, but there are thousands of universes, so we don't know about the others. 
And if you like that idea, well, you can become an astronomer, become a, uh, a rocket scientist. What about all that? Uh, whatever your passion is, wherever your draw is, that's where you should go. And that's my suggestion on how to start a business, is find something you love. And you'll just dance with that beauty for the rest of your life. And you'll be happy because you'll be in step and you'll be doing something you love. And it'll show in every waking moment of your life that you'll share with others. As an example of finding something you really love, uh, I, I'm in saddlery. That's my main business. In the past, uh, I, I bought the Australian stock saddle to America in uh, 1979. And uh, since then, I have sold over three million. That's just amazing. In my case, what I love doing is working with horses. So I pursued that. When I was 14, I asked my father for a stock saddle, and he said, go and build your own. He says, any idiot can make a stock saddle. So I did. And uh, years later, I became very successful in, in, as a writer. But um, the, the call of the saddle kept coming back to me. I really want to mess with saddles. I love building that saddle. I loved it. I love riding too, but I love building that saddle. So um, I noticed Americans were riding this clunky Western saddle or trying to stay in English saddles, and we have an Australian stock saddle. It's very hard to fall out of, but very comfortable. It sits close to the horse, much like an English saddle. So I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to recreate that thing, bring it to America. I was already very successful as a journalist and, and international correspondent, but it wasn't fulfilling everything. I wanted to use my hands and use something, be original, as Elizabeth Taylor once told me I should be doing instead of writing stories about her and Richard Burton and embarrass the hell out of her. She said, should do something with your life. And I said, fine, I'm going to do that. So I thought, I'm going to get off and make a saddle business, and I did. But it was no problem at all. One thing I had working for me was, or a couple of things I had working for me, is I have a knowledge of the horse and what it likes. And I have a knowledge of how to build saddles from when I was a kid. And uh, so I thought, that's it. Why not? Yeah. With a boost from The Man from Snowy River, that great movie, which I ripped off and said that this was, a, this was my saddle in that movie. It wasn't really, but it was an Australian stock saddle, which was identical to my saddle. So why wouldn't I call it my saddle? It really was. I had adopted it. So um, uh, it was very easy to give something to people that they wanted and liked. So that was my success story with that saddle. Um, I've worked out that I've sold over $30 million worth of saddles in 40 years. That's a lot of saddles. Uh, and I made a, a lot of money out of it. Spent it, but I spent it having a good time, and I spent it buying a, a very, a very um, valuable Malibu property. So I invested wisely as well as spent heavily and had a great time pursuing what I loved, which was horses and saddlery. And I became a great saddler, not because I was, but because I'm a writer. I could write about saddlery, so I wrote cleverly about saddlery, where it came from, where the saddles came from, how Australians built them. And pretty soon I, be, I became known as an expert saddler. But I wasn't really. What I was was a writer. I wrote about saddles. That made me an expert. There's a lesson in that. They call it niche marketing. Well, that means you're filling a very small niche of need in our culture. And remember, there are 330 million people in America. If you've got one million of them as customers, how rich would you be? You could be selling something for a couple of dollars and you'd be you'd be very wealthy but one million out of 330 million that's 0.2 percent i think it is 0.2 of one percent and that's all you've penetrated well i'm a niche marketer i sell an australian stock saddle i've worked out that i've reached just five percent of the people in america who own horses just five percent 
I haven't reached 95%. But yet I was able to sell $30 million worth of salary in my career. Niche marketing. Find something small. Something it doesn't have to be small as long as you like doing it. And find a niche for it. Uh, there's mass, mass marketing, but that's mass marketing. You need millions of dollars. And the other thing about niche marketing is you start it in your garage. There's most of the major businesses in the world today were started by somebody in their garage, including Amazon, including including just about including any any of the Detroit uh, motor companies. Scratch their surface and go back, and you'll find a tinkerer doing a making a Model T Ford in his backyard a hundred years ago. That's how it is. There's niche marketing is the beginning of something, or if you develop just that niche, you'll make more money than you could possibly spend in your lifetime if you just reach a fraction of 1% of the population directly. That's what I do. Another adventure in discovering self-happiness is having a conversation with yourself. You're now, I'm in my case, I'm 81 years old, so I think about what I did when I was 14, 15, 20, 25, and uh, then I wonder if I do anything different today that I did then. Or you can advance it to when you're middle age. Was there something you did there that you wish you hadn't done and you uh, wish you could change? But the past, you cannot change. It happens. However, at this moment in time, you are neither in the past nor the future. However, you do have an opportunity to make an impact on the future because you can have that conversation with yourself right now and say, ask yourself, am I doing something here that in 10 years' time when I look back I would say to myself, I wish I hadn't done that. Can I identify those characters now? That saves a whole lot of heartache. Whatever it is you're doing now that you wish you were not doing. Maybe it's being lazy, maybe it's drinking too much or you know, running out, running around with the wrong woman or women or whatever, but you have an opportunity to correct that now. If you feel that in 10 years' time you're going to look back and say, I wish I had changed that, now is the time and the opportunity for you to change the things you don't want to be doing and you'll regret 10 years' time that you did.